This is my first live stream. I am a visual artist currently based in Berlin. My name is Andrea Karch and I um, am currently working on a self-initiated artistic research project called Schmerz Conversations on Crisis. Yeah, and I'm very glad that we have some viewers here with us. I'm happy that you're here. Feel free to send us your questions and comments in the chat. Um, and this is my first oh, first guest, John Holton, <laughs> Schmerz, episode one. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for having me. Still getting used to everything, also being mirrored. Um, John Holton is a novelist, an artist and curator. And he is also the author of The Ready Mates, which was published in 2011, and Oslo, Norway, which was published in 2015. And The Ready Mates was actually described in um, the magazine Art in America as one of the greatest works of art to come out of Berlin in recent years. So, congratulations. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But you're also the co-founder of Broken Dimanche Press, um, which was founded in 2009 and is also based in Berlin. Um, and you describe yourselves as a European publishing house. And I think you're also way more than uh, just a publishing house. Um, you host events and readings and workshops and also, I think, initiated several programs to um, kind of foster the local scene and to bridge literature and the arts correct me if i'm wrong but yeah that sounds, it's that super sounds interesting good. it's really interesting it's really worth to check it out um, and you're also the host and producer of the empathy when podcast series thank you for coming thank you for speaking to me and i actually um read a short book critique that you wrote for Arts of the Working Class, which I also have here with me for everyone who doesn't know them yet. But yeah, when I read your book review on James Joyce's monumental novel uh, Ulysses, I thought, wow, this is really, I would love to discuss this further with you. So my first question about um, this book review, which also has an amazing title, <laughs> the title is a post-colonial Netflix anthology novel, <laughs> um, hard for a German to pronounce. So in this book review, you draw a very clear connection to Brexit, for instance. Um, and I don't know how familiar our um, few viewers are with Ulysses. I guess they, they might be familiar with it. Um, but can you elaborate more on the connection you see between Ulysses and our context today? Yeah, well, thank you very much for, for that uh, introduction. <laughs> that was really nice uh, summary of, of, I guess, various different activities. Yeah, just to maybe sum up Ulysses or introduce it briefly, because it might help bringing it to the context um, of today. It was written in the years, seven years prior to its publication in 1922 um, by an Irishman, James Joyce, who was living abroad. And at the time, he would have been a passport holder, although passports, probably, I don't, he might not have even had a passport, actually, don't think, but they weren't such, in such big use back then. But uh, Ireland only became independent of the UK in uh, 1922. And... At the time, it actually, uh, well, and to this day, it uh, left behind six counties, which is commonly referred to as Northern Ireland, uh, and that's still part of the United Kingdom. And um, so Ulysses is set in one day, it's a modernist classic, it's set in one day in 1904, which is also interesting um, to think about. Um, and it has a hero who is a who is a, a, an Irish Irish man called Leopold Bloom and the heroes of the novel are him and Stephen Dedalus which is an autobiographical take of Joyce himself and Molly Bloom Leopold's uh, uh, wife and so the story kind of follows uh, roughly some of Ulysses's uh, adventures in the Odyssey mapped across Dublin on this one day and so it's full of all sorts of little sides and, and characters and it's very 
possibly novel. And just to sum up that title of the book of the book review, uh, the, the it comes in eighteen episodes. Um, each episode is told in a different different style, as it were. So uh, I kind of had in my mind Black Mirror anthology series on on Netflix, which every episode is kind of distinct. Or if, <laughs> if you, yeah, or if you think of uh, uh, the Twilight Zone, or so many in the past t- TV shows franchises, effectively. So Joyce kind of did this kind of to show off in one one respect, uh, but also just to kind of break apart the novel and put it back again, which is what modernism was so good at doing. And um, in the context of Brexit, uh, that kind of, so six counties uh, kind of had a very turbulent history uh, when Ireland got independence from the UK and uh, we had a kind of large scale terrorist campaign uh, conducted on the both islands of the British Isles um, by the IRA and then there were some loyalist terrorist groups who were believed in the, the union um, with the United Kingdom and they were against uh, IRA or nationalist tendencies and so there was this kind of simmering conflict in Europe uh, that the EU because of its borderless nature uh, kind of allowed to find peace. So in 97, there was a, a signing of something called the Good Friday Agreement, which allowed for this quite complex um, war and, and kind of content, contentious uh, land with very opposite uh, opinions um, of each other, of what should ha- how this place should be considered, c- could find peace effectively or kind of find a way to, to live together, which was which is remarkable, especially if you think of other kind of similar um, contested historical uh, areas such as, as such as Palestine and the, 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 the conflicts in the Middle East there. So the EU then uh, kind of had this uh, 20 years of, of peace uh, in a sense before until Brexit came along with its vote for, by the British people of 40, 52% of those who voted to leave the EU. And then what that meant was that the EU had to kind of go back and, and look at this border of the six counties and so suddenly um, you just had this kind of uh, uh, kind of re-emergence of what it means to actually live next door to uh, this, this this country the United Kingdom um, and so yeah there's many ways to look at Ulysses uh, in the current climate and I think one way that's not often uh, considered or people kind of forget about is that the fact that it's got a lot of post-colonial uh, interests for the modern day academic <laughs> or a reader or, 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 or just lover of, of, of stories and history um, because because of this kind of uh, fact that it was written um, by an Irish man who was technically a British subject but uh, was first published in Paris uh, and uh, the, con- the same year that the country Ireland came into existence one of the first countries in a way to break with the, the British Empire um, so yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the context in relationship to uh, the post-colonial aspect to it, and I think Brexit, in a way, is has been described in many different ways. But one way you could think about it is a, a nostalgia for a colonial project, in a sense, um, so that there was a kind of strand of of kind of English nationalism, perhaps that that helped the boat kind of make it. Uh, across the line so to speak so that brexit kind of could become a reality um so yeah um there's other things that we can talk about um if you want (laughs) Uh, yeah i think you already mentioned a lot um which might also come up later again in some of my questions um but maybe to stay a bit um because it opens up so much and it's such a um complicated uh, story yeah, history, history. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe to come back to really the text you wrote for arts of the working class um, in which you wrote to call something difficult is a power move an effort at denying people's curiosity in the face of the complex and the challenging and you also wrote that identity should be based on openness curiosity pleasure sympathy easy now um so i was really interested in this and in what you actually really mean by this and why you think that it is easy now yeah 
Yeah, it's funny that you you had that line uh, mentioned because it, when I wrote the Easy Now, what I hear in my mind is a farmer talking to a to a maybe an irate horse or a it's kind of a horse whispering thing like Easy oh, Now, okay. Easy Now, uh, <laughs> kind of. Um, but but also it kind of has that sense of like the sense this kind of idea that it's um, now is the time for to consider these things easy to, oh, to I do. See. Um, um, when we think about like reading literature uh, that's difficult, uh, I think people, I think I always think back to my first experiences of reading and lear like learning to spend time with a book and kind of wondering if I'd be able to finish it. And then the sense of accomplishment when I did finish it. And it's kind of this self-perpetuating drama of uh, will I or won't I be able to finish this? And then um, that then you kind of realize, oh, actually, I can run this race. I've got the strength to finish it. And then you realize the difficulty becomes more about um, the kind of way in which the story might be told. Uh, and so then um, it kind of just becomes a way of... Um, so I think that's a, that's something that we all have, and we shouldn't forget that we've basically got these these, these inner strengths to, to kind of... Uh, nurture. Uh, so it's the same with like the, the analogy with exercise is kind of good because people say, oh, I could never be able to run five kilometers or something. But actually, you know, we all have the technically we have the same the same body in one sense or another. Um, so uh, there, it's inherent. It's inherent in us to be able to do these things. So calling something difficult is one way to. Yeah, I think effectively give people an option out to not try. Uh, but it's also a way to, I guess, make scare people. Uh, 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 again, maybe to keep the sport analogy going, like I'm a runner, which is unlikely because I've not never been very sport sporty. But in my uh, near to middle age, I've just I've become a runner, and I, it's amazing how many people are, are constantly telling me, "Oh, you shouldn't run; it's going to ruin your knees." Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, it's always always people who don't run, mind you, and maybe they're right, you know, and maybe eventually someday my knees will be sore, like more arthritic than their knees. But uh, it's definitely not like a a bad thing for me, and so it's the same thing with like I think a lot of art and a lot of um, uh, <clears throat> art forms and artworks when people when it's, things are considered difficult, it's a way of uh, basically kind of giving you an opt out or not even to try. And then if we think about it in a political sense in this post-colonial uh, kind of context that we just started to talk about or think about, it's the same thing where people start wringing their hand and say, oh, Israel and Palestine, it's so difficult that it's just intractable and we'll never, we'll never be able to solve it, you know. And I think, uh, you know, we got, we're like a tremendous species. We're to totally pig-headed and determined to kind of overcome so many uh, problems. So what's difficult, you know, one day is not suddenly difficult the next. And uh, yeah, and I think that that's, that's something that we should lean into with those tools that I kind of mentioned <laughs> so easygoingly, uh, as you said. <laughs> you mentioned fear as well, or to be scared of something um, at some point. Um, and I actually, just a few days ago, when I reread the questions um, and also your text, I, um, I shortly after actually watched a piece that was um, shown on Arte, on this German-French TV channel. Um, and it was a conversation with a European, or a minister of the European Parliament, with Jean, Jean Asselborn. Um, and he's also the foreign minister of Luxembourg. Um, and he actually said, and I just translated this, so it might not be literally what he said, but he said something like, the peace in Europe doesn't depend on contracts, but, but how, on how we live our values. And he also said that in 2004, Europe was meant to somehow bring an advantage or it was this ideal, this triumphant idea, basically. And today it is rather about fear. And he said that the biggest challenge for the EU today is to actually take away young people's fear um, of their future or for their future. And, um, and I was wondering if this fear might have something to do with this difficulty or calling something difficult 
as well and not being um, willing to engage or willing to somehow take on the challenge. Yeah, I mean, that's a really um, interesting point. I think like that is uh, so true. I think it also what brought to my mind there when you talked about fear is, for example, how um, people as as a group can end up acting against their own best wishes or kind of in a collective contradiction when under the uh, auspices of fear. Right. Uh, and I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking here about, for example, when we uh, suffer a terrorist attack, for example, and the kind of reaction by some governments have been in the past to start doing quite illiberal things in the name of uh, kind of protection or counterterrorism, and and we've had like twenty years of that security. now. Security. September 11th. Yeah, security exactly, um, and that's kind of predicated on how malleable people become when they're scared. And so I think it's not, it's not an exaggeration to say that um, a lot of, for example, America, but you know, a lot of Western countries kind of kept in this sphere. And before, before the 9/11 attacks, it was communism. Uh, at least before the fall of the, the wall, before 98, 89 or 91. And so there's always kind of a collective fear. And I think now we're entering like the most pressing, like, probably realistic uh, threat, <laughs> which is like uh, ecological and environmental catastrophe. And that's, you know, a genuine fear. Um, and, and I think it's what's really interesting is that it's kind of not really easy for any one government to utilize that uh, to their own nefarious ends or for business to kind of, I mean, you can maybe be a bit cynical and say, okay, sure, there's like all sorts of commercial people, uh, interests trying to monopolize uh, or cash in on, on people's collective fear of the future. But in general, it's uh, it's such a it's such a genuine problem that, that the difficulty <laughs> to call the climate crisis difficult is, is kind of apt. And that's suddenly when you re realize that it's a... Uh, yeah, this, but that's straying into I think another over. I mean, that you could make branch this whole conversation um, around the ecological and and the environmental ongoing catastrophe. But uh, I think what I'm more interested in the, in the person to person and the societal, or at least in the, this context. To get back to those remarks, I think yeah, Europe has a has a an obligation to itself. To maintain the social welfare state and, and 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 a social democratic model, because at the end of the day, that's the one thing it 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 uh, um, it's got going for it. You know that it could potentially give a model to to kind of collective happiness and um, pro progress. But it's but again to bring it back to Joyce. I mean, the thing about Joyce is that it was all he was totally engaging in new technology. So new does new technologies all throughout Ulysses, and Ulysses itself is uh, you know really influenced by, for example, cinema. Like not, mm -hmm. not a lot of people know that Joyce was Joyce was one of the first people to bring cinema to to Ireland, for example, which is weird because he was living at the time in Italy. And he, he saw one of Italy's first um, uh, cinemas in operation. He convinced this Italian cinema maker to go to Ireland and set up one called Volta Cinema. So it's kind of this this idea that, again, uh, I, I just one other thing, actually, to not jump around too much, but this idea of difficulty and, for example, a Netflix anthology. Um, when, it, when, in, when a TV series radically... Uh, alters the, the the format of its of its of its show it kind of takes a gamble because in a way it's banked bank so much of this is banking on on a, on a clear recognizable form and you know what you're going into as a viewer it's comfortable and if you break that then of course that's gonna it's hard to audience test that or to kind of know how super fans will will take it you know it's the same with with sequels uh, and, and right. follow-ups to to any franchise sorry am i breaking nope. up no. No. All good. So anyway, I just think, I just think that there's a lot of continuity there. That uh, that's why I say now more than ever, we as as readers uh, can understand what Joyce was up to. He was like, it's not that crazy to shift gears uh, when you're when you're trying to, um, I guess, yeah, to tell stories over that uh, over an anthology, you know. Right. Um, and the uh, the audiences are smart enough to to do it uh, to to go along with it to follow you. Right. <laughs>
I actually already told you that I usually in my previous project uh, projects um, described the, our times as fragmented. And then mm -hmm. I thought that I, your idea of an anthology was so much more positive, actually. It's such a positive description of our zeitgeist or um, yeah, the way how we consume um, images, information, news and so on. Um, and it doesn't feel so, I don't know, I've, I felt like also in your text, it's a lot more, you know, it feels like we are flexible and we are free and it's all just so light and it's no problem to read Ulysses, you know, <laughs> while well, to me it always um, felt really heavy, actually. Um, but where are where do you see the the power in this um also you called your podcast empathy when so in this kind of positivity or these um yeah how do you what's its value or how do you see potential there for positive change or to actually you know go against nationalism and against um all these developments that we have seen in the past years well, that kind of gets to the to the to the nub of some things uh, for sure that I've been interested in, and 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 I think empathy is a is a contested term for some people. Some people, for example, suggest that we often mix it up with compassion, um, which is true. You can't have empathy for everybody in its strict definition, in the sense that um, you can have sympathy. For, but uh, if with somebody's uh, life experiences, but uh, empathy can't really uh, hope to stretch it to everybody but that's not to say that the role of art and, and telling stories you know isn't doing uh, kind of a lot of what empathy is, is suggesting you do which is basically take the point of view um or this again this life experience of somebody else than you, you yourself and and dare to consider it and spend time with it so much that you then be able to to tell a story about it or represent it through through various arts mm -hmm. and and that's kind of become contested uh over time and i think again through this new technology this sheer exposure that we've had um with the internet uh, for good reason because it's been abused a lot uh over the centuries over the whole of the history of humankind where powerful people or malign people with malevolent intentions have you know used other people uh, and uh, abused them and and then sold their stories <laughs> and told a particular story that suited them and so right. yeah it's been a very sophisticated uh kind of attempt to counteract that and now kind of this this uh in this moment in time we i think have gotten uh there's a danger potentially i think about being scared of telling complicated stories and therefore telling other people's stories and again to kind of use Ulysses as an example it's obviously written by a white male but he chose for example to the hero of the story is is uh, Leopold Bloom who happens to be uh, his, his father was a Hungarian Jew so he he was Jewish uh, and there's not many I mean to this day there's only around 10,000 Jewish people in Ireland I think and at the time maybe there was a bit more but generally it was this kind of uh, prophetic decision of Joyce to kind of make the hero of his of his of the everyday mm -hmm. uh, a, mm -hmm. a Jew because of all that would happen uh, quite quite you know disastrously right. for Europe in, in relationship to that and so nowadays I think a, a fantastic ability would be to uh, yeah, it would be a, would be kind of imagining a generous and considered use of empathy in relationship to other people, and um, and what I mean by that is that you're we're not scared of of thinking about other people. Um, for example, Hannah Arendt has wonderful kind of uh, pa passages where she thinks about like the danger of unthinking that we. Uh, again, if we say I'm not allowed to tell somebody else's story because that's wrong, and I'm talking here, I guess, about what's called identity culture. You know, yeah. uh, if you, if you, if if I, if I, 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 then I don't have to imagine what that person, uh, who that person is, and therefore, yeah, I certainly don't really need to to worry about that, and that can kind of set in chain potentially 
a societal moment where you end up blocking out more than you, uh, you know, allow allow in, and suddenly you're in a in a kind of closed, uh, you know, a, a closed vantage point, um, and that means all sorts of, I think, quite dangerous things, um, um, racism, nationalism, xenophobia, a fear of the other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a it's an exciting time technologically. Like no, a child born no matter where in the world will be able to imagine life quite quickly elsewhere. That hasn't always been the case. But we need we need right. to be able to we need to be able to imagine what to do with this. You know, like Hollywood doesn't need to make all the movies now. Literally, I've got like a good enough camera with this piece of technology than some of the directors of most of the 20th century had. I can edit on this computer better than, you know, most of the editors uh, in Hollywood could for most of the 20th century. We can all make our own movies, potentially. <laughs> That's <laughs> our own true. Netflix series. But it's like, how do we, how do you disseminate it? How, who controls it? Who, you know, it's more, more, more now, now more than ever uh, for everything. Right. Um, we are also broadcasting ourselves. So we yeah. have all become producers in a way. So again, like what Hannah Arendt is kind of reminding us to do, like we, we have to be questioning. Um, but in terms of like put questioning in a, in a, in a constructive sense, in a, in a kind of almost this transcendental, like who, who, what is the moral compass by which I operate and how does that working with people yeah so i mean it's tough i mean i think we're also like, living in post uh, religious societies in in the european union and um that means that we don't have a lot of understanding about common things like that um <laughs> which is the one certainty that we should all uh, be aware of and yet we we kind of suddenly find ourselves increasingly without the institutions to deal with them you know or or the people to which normally uh, societies would have to talk about i.e. priests uh, or, or shamans or, or whatever you would you would have. So we have to kind of, uh, yeah, kind of almost, I think what I'm always thinking about is a radical way of uh, learning through the internet and devices or through Twitch. It's like for gamers who like kids these days play games. In the 90s, or not in the 90s, in the 2000s, you were on Facebook and everybody was learning how to be on a social media for the first time. Now the kids are, are in social uh, networks inside computer games on 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 Discord and talking to each other, and so it's about kind of finding your uh, communities mm -hmm. through technology in in um, in ways that hopefully allow for like this open and curiosity for other people, as opposed to you know what a more hardline uh, set of beliefs might like end up creating so that you're suddenly in a i don't know some 4chan extremist right. group <laughs> for yeah unfortunately this uh, logic um kind of works for everybody i guess i mean i think uh, the internet yeah. brought um positive change for certain communities but also um, possibilities for communities that we actually do not want to have in our midst it's it's complicated. It's like our worst aspects are all reflected back in the, back to us in the technology. I don't know who said this. I think I'm thinking <laughs> somebody. It's reflected back to us in the technology that we've created. Definitely. Um, but in the end, it is there, and we are already living with it, and it will not go, go away or disappear. So, um, I I think yeah. we have to learn how to deal with it and learn how to also be able to read it right and how to read information yeah. and sources and also ways of storytelling yeah and it's like kind of to remind ourselves what is what kind of set us to be for example if you take an angry nationalist in europe who is upset with uh refugees or just immigrants people come in but specifically refugees which is which is kind of it's insane because actually the the, the the word itself is is someone who is mm -hmm. like seeking refuge. It's someone who is uh, quite literally a fellow human who's destitute and in trouble. And so we've there's a really radical lack of empathy when you're upset with a, about a refugee about refugees in general. There's a lot of things that have gone on that you have that you've suffered enough that you that you as a as a as a Western nationalist who's upset with them that you've actually suffered 
uh, a kind of collapse of your ability to think and to em empathize and to uh, well, actually this is an example of actually empathy being maybe it misused is. You, I you think could, it is. I, for example I, I yeah, yeah exactly I think in in this um, example that you mentioned it's I mean I'm not a psychologist or an expert on this um, topic but um, it seems to me or I could imagine that it has a lot to do with having actually a lot of empathy but um, for the wrong side in a way I mean mm -hmm. um, so that actually the, the whole narrative of nationalists or right-wingers or right-wing extremists is actually this idea of being threatened, right? Um, something is going to be taken mm. away from you or, um, yeah, you are literally under threat um, and in danger, which is why, I guess, you are empathetic to um, this idea of your own or, um, I don't know, the same as you are or the in germany the das volk the people um the nation right um so you're actually overly empathetic i think with with this uh whole construct construct or idea it's also like interesting because to think it's uh, there are also it's also a lot of it's storytelling like, it is thinking about it so It's definitely the stories we tell ourselves. And I think <laughs> it's uh, it also yeah. has so, so much to do with emotions, which is uh, why yes. you also mentioned before that Ulysses was actually written or published in a time where it wasn't so common to have this um, focus on the individual or on um, you know Leopold Bloom's or the main characters' internal monologues and. Um, Yeah, kind of this whole madness and mistakes and this whole self-reflection. Um, but of course, mm -hmm. today we are living in a society where everything is hyper-individualized. So mm -hmm. it doesn't seem strange to us anymore. But I thought this was really interesting in the uh, comparison as well. Or I think this is very relevant for today as well. Yeah, it's also funny to think about because it's the book, its publication history was really um, challenged because right. of obscenity. So it wasn't even published in the UK to begin with. But when it was being printed in France, some of the printers were like, oh, my God, this this is like it's obscene. Right. And they decided to just try and destroy it because they would be uh, charged um, with obscenity. Uh, and all he was doing really was, you know, actually just showing normal things happening, like from defecation to masturbation to sex. And I mean, obviously that sounds like a lot. But, uh, to gender transitions as well. <laughs> no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, all of this, you see, was very controversial at the time. And uh, and right up until the 50s and 60s, you know, that that's really hard to imagine how uptight society was. And and I think again, like go back to this idea that we're we're young, we're youthful users of this new um, technology, uh, which again is just giving us ourselves back. You know, it's a the internet is a mirror to ourselves, and it's uh yeah, and it's really challenging. I think like it's really. Um, But so so much full of positivity. I mean, that, that's why it's so much easier to like get hung up on the challenges of the, of the, of what we're going through with regard to technology. But really, it's it's far outweighed by all the benefits. Um, but yeah, we have to we have to learn how to uh, yeah, kind of operate this playground well i do think internet. it's also um, a political question really or also a political task probably so you're right like we do have to learn how to kind of construct judicial measures in place that reflect the real world you know the digital right it's you know we apply that with with there's some taboos which is another kind of topic of conversation which is not the same as obscenity but there's some things that you know we just as humans don't want to happen like pedophilia or uh cannibalism <laughs> you know and the, the internet can allow for this sadly to happen so therefore of course we, we need to create boundaries um it's like yeah 
But many of these things have existed before as well, also during the time of Leopold Bloom. I don't, I'm not even sure if we ever mentioned um, when uh, the story actually, or which time the story of Ulysses is actually set in. It's 1904, 1904 yeah. one day in 1904. So I think there are lots of similarities also with, you know, in 1904, the nationalism and everything that led up to World War I. Um, but also um, consumer culture and um, and industrialization, um, um, yeah, the modern era basically, and technology and all the things that came with it. Um, so I think a lot of these uh, issues and things have already been there for a long time. Um, but of course, today they they find they find different um, outlets or um, that's and that's why I think it is so important um, that we, you know, learn or are aware of these kind of sto practices of storytelling. And this is why I thought um, it would be so interesting, and it was so interesting to um, to speak to you about this um, because it's really a lot about how stories are told and who tells them, um, and how we consume them. And speaking about this, do you as an author and publisher and artist, do you see mm, the act of reading, writing and publishing as an act of resistance? Uh, I would like to think so. Uh, yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Don't, no. I mean, t in, jokes aside, like absolutely. I mean, I've always tried to write uh, resisted the easy story. So there's a the classic cliche of creative writing classes is write what you know, and again, like that's true. A lot of young writers would want to tell some kind of crazy story or life experience that they have no, no experience of, and fail. And it's kind of. But I also kind of was like, fuck that. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to write about like. Uh, Ireland somehow. So I actually ended up my first novel, The Ready Maids, um, would actually actually ended up telling a story of the utter end of what D Daniel Lukic, the Ser Serbian or Yugoslavian writer, mm -hmm. called the, the bloody edges of Europe uh, down in in the uh, former Yugoslavia in the Balkans. So my first story is is told um, by by uh, uh, a person radically different from me in the sense of of uh, cultural uh, origin. But I felt it was really important because it was uh, a lot of fun as a writer, but it was also to resist this this idea of like that telling the easy story. And again, like of course, you could imagine that the, the pushback in my mind is like, well, how? Why would I try and tell this really complicated uh, uh, story that I was creating about it was basically about lovers and bread. And, and separated by across borders and, and trying to live with the history of, of experience of war. I've never been to war, at least not as combatant. And uh, yeah, and so all these questions. And it was like, well, you know, that's kind of to resist this uh, temptation of telling the easy story. Uh, it's just really difficult. And I also didn't know anything about the wars in the Balkans that right. happened in my lifetime uh, on my continent. And so as somebody who really believes in like the European project as a peace uh, project i was like what the hell you know how did this happen and and, and what the hell did it and it again was very similar because i grew up on the border of this of where he started this conversation with northern ireland these six counties that were left behind in the united kingdom i, mm -hmm. I grew up you know surrounded by these these um, sectarian divisions and so right. it's quite similar in a way so and that's the pleasant thing and certainly there's more similarities uh, and so for every you know Every comparison is a contrast, and every contrast is a kind of comparison to be made. And suddenly, um, yeah, suddenly the, the the resistance is kind of there, and the excitement of the story, and 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 how how well you can do that. And then on top of that was this idea of like, well, I'm not nobody's going to really publish this novel because I'm I'm a known writer, and in the UK I had translation actually at the core of the the story, which is also an important tool in the in the empathy or compassion toolbox. But uh, at the time, publishing houses in the UK weren't that interested in translation. Uh, sadly, to this day, still aren't, same as in America. Um, 
And so I was like, nobody's going to really publish this. And so, yeah, I kind of had already started to publish a few books with, as Broken Demand Press, um, which started out as a kind of tool to, yeah, make sure that young people were allowed the opportunity to make books uh, that might not have commercial uh, mm -hmm. potential. So again, like it's inherited technologies and obviously the book is one of the oldest technologies and I love it as a technology, but the dissemination of it is distinctly uh, 19th century or 20th century. It's national, it's, it's language divided in Europe. It's uh, so certainly a publishing house will be by default a kind of German publishing house or a, U a mm -hmm. British or Irish mm -hmm. or Norwegian publishing house. And I found that really uh, decidedly not 21st century Europe, you know, and so we were like, yeah, let's, you know, let's resist this by sure by like calling ourselves European and uh, sadly I didn't, we haven't translated as many books as we should have, but we definitely translated yeah. a bunch and English became the lingua franca, but that's, mm -hmm. that's also, I think, okay, but it's also something I'm constantly aware of and interested in. Um, so yeah, it was like various forms of resistance, I think, throughout. And also I, the joke was we always tried to be funny and I think Humor is a great tool of resistance and empathy or compassion. But uh, we always try to be funny. And the joke was, of course, that, you know, if the avant garde of the early 20th century were international in spirit and, and probably usually very political um, on the left or the right wing, we were just going to be kind of blandly social democratic. <laughs> uh, but it's still, that's basically maybe, you know, our generation's fight. And it kind of has been since when we first made the first book in 2009 things kind of only got worse in Europe for social democracy. So Correct. in ways that, yeah, it would have been hard to imagine at the time. So yeah, like it's very important to resist. Uh, my sister is a great uh, protester and, and activist. She's, a, she's an artist who in a way kind of helped get me into um, reading books like Joyce, but also uh, publishing and the art world. And she, yeah, has kind of over the recent years really made uh, activism a part of her practice as an artist. And that's always very inspiring. What's really interesting I find about the idea, this ter term resistance or, or to resist mm -hmm. as a verb is how is close it is to being reactionary. Uh, mm -hmm. So that you're resisting change. It's uh, Right. And so suddenly it's, again, like it's a whole other conversation. Like what, what do we conserve? And what do we throw away, you know, uh, and, you know, to be conservative is, is a derogatory term in left wing English like language speaking circles. Uh, is it the same in German? If you're I think conservative, so. Yeah, you're old and conservative. It's kind of like it uh, goes. <laughs> but, uh, but maybe there are some things that we want to conserve. I mean, especially if you think about it in terms of like the ecological catastrophe, like we do want to conserve things. We want to conserve a lot of things, hopefully. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I never got quite asked that question before with the resistance, yeah. <laughs> right, but it's interesting because I think this was also quite an um, um, elementary or essential um, element of narration of, you know, parties like the Pegida or the AfD, the Alternative for, uh, Alternative for Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany, um, the right-wing party that is now actually um, also part of our government, um, that they, you know, they kind of have this narrative that they are actually the revolution, right? And they are um, actually... Um, the others are the reactionaries and yeah. not them, although they actually, of course, are um, anti-globalization. Um, they, uh, they want to go back to this idea of the nation state and, um, and yeah, I don't know, the island or, um, and they want a strong a leader and all these things right so actually you would think that this is a really back these are all backwards um, ideas that that don't have any traction today anymore that simply cannot um, cannot even exist in the times that we live in and uh, and it's not obviously not sustainable and and all these things but yeah, their narrative is actually exactly the opposite, right? It's exactly, mm. no, we are the change and we are pushing for change and we are mm. challenging the status quo and the establishment and so on. Yeah. 
It's true. I mean, it's also a good point. If you think about it, there's also, if you detach it from the, the political organization, there are elements that, again, like a left wing person or anybody could agree are good. Like, so, which is to do with like the local. So, like, shop local, you know, go to support right. your local farmer's market or, uh, you know, so there's elements of that that I, I for one, could like understand in a sense. Um, and so it's always like, again, like, I think that's where compassion and and empathy come with like i i mean i'm saying this as if i do this all the time i don't but to to, to try and to understand where somebody's coming from you can find that actually maybe good things there but i uh <laughs> i don't know why i sound like i'm endorsing the afd or something i'm, I'm decidedly not but uh it's just this is what it's what i'm interested in our relationship with technology it's the same with the relationship with globalism for example because like i wouldn't have necessarily always been a massive fan of of mm. globalism but it's scary then to uh, what exactly form the opposition to that would take you know so right. um but again I, and i think that's going to be because of the technology and the point that we're at the global and the local will be something that we have to constantly relearn our relationship to as we go forward i mean that's something i think every every technological advance has brought uh, trains brought it right the, you know telegram brought it tv brought it the printing press <laughs> yeah before that the printing press quite literally i mean it's incredible to think right can you just maybe say um or briefly say what um the ready mates is actually about yeah i used to struggle for a while to explain the story but it's quite simple um i play around a bit with what's real and what's not and so the story begins with a version of me john holton in paris and i come across or the character comes across a manuscript um by various means and gets it translated and all the while he's kind of under a bit of pressure to not to publish it but he finds it very interesting and he met the author of the manuscript before the author died and so there's kind of this strange opening few chapters where you're like okay there's this dead serbian artist who seemed to be very sad and this uh, manuscript and it seems to be that people don't want it to be published um and then uh, around a third of the way into the book the manuscript is presented so it's a book within the book uh, and that makes up most of the, the novel and that manuscript tells the story of a group of artists called the lgb group uh, that i made up uh, they are kind of based on various artist groups throughout history um particularly i guess the 20th century uh, like the the Nouveau, nouveau realists in the in the 60s 50s and 60s and in, in centered around paris and before that uh the dadists in particular so this is kind of history of the the data uh the ready-made ob art object using everyday life again a very joycean idea actually that joyce celebrated the everyday uh that's kind of throughout a lot of 20th century uh art and literature is this, this celebration right up to andy warhol's soup cans to uh various performance day-long performances and stuff of modern time but christian mark plays the clock i don't know it's all over the place the day the day is the unit so these artists celebrate the day and yeah and suddenly you'll be you're, you're, the, the manuscript the book within the book starts off as a kind of academic history of this of this art group so it's very placed and i love doing the research i place it within the time the time was the 1990s um and so unfortunately it starts to fall apart because the the, the 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 person telling this academic story is the the man who is died in the beginning of the book, Georgi Bojic, this this kind of tragic hero, and it turns out that the the, the book is a uh, kind of a love letter to his his uh, the love of his life, who, in a way, he could never really share his experiences of the war, uh, particularly the war uh, that he served in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, Bosnia. Uh, which was one of the earlier wars that uh, precipitated the collapse of of, uh, of, of the, the whole Balkan region in a way. And so, yeah, and then you kind of get closer and closer to this kind of uh, dark point in the in the in this character's life, uh, all the while kind of reading about their coming of age as artists and kind of leaving Yugoslavia or, or Serbia and coming first to Austria and then to Paris. Um, 
and so yeah, you can gather from that that it's kind of a it's kind of an odd story. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's not an odd story. It's kind of it's it's a very normal, sadly, kind of story in in the sense in the broad strokes of I was definitely influenced by a lot of um, various European uh, moments of history and stories that come out of it. Um, and so when I was writing it, I I, I uh, was here in Berlin, and uh, like I said, I'd already made one or two books with Broken Dimanche Press, and I was introduced one night to a guy at a party called mm-hmm. Darko. Uh, fantastic name, Darko Djedjicovic, <laughs> and <laughs> he was uh, an artist, is an artist, and uh, from Serbia. And I, I got very scared because I was writing this this, this novel that basically, <laughs> weirdly, kind of had a very similar version of him. He said, "John, I'd love to read your oh book," God. and I said, "Well, oh, I want I want you to tell me about it." And of course, you know, for reasons that we were talking about earlier, I was like, "Geez, you know," and this was a. It was just this weird thing where I just wrote it in in kind of ex- exile or like not exile seclusion, uh, me- yeah, mental. I didn't even mm-hmm. think about it. Artistic exile. I was like, you know, this could be a disaster, politically wrong, historically yeah. wrong. <laughs> and anyway, eventually, I, I took him up on the offer. He said, "I'd love to read." I said, I'll, "I'll," and I sent him the manuscript. And I said to my partner at the time, I said, "You know, he can really sync this, and I won't mind." I've had a lot of fun writing it. It's been I researched so much. I finally understood a lot more about these wars. And, and yeah, thankfully he wrote back and he said, I just read it. He was in Milan and hotel. He said, I just read it all in, in one day and I was crying. It was fabulous. And he loved it. And he helped me with some historical and, or not historical, but like all these beautiful, which I kind of loved. I loved getting them wrong. Like the tram number eight wouldn't cross that bridge in, in that direction in Belgrade. It would go only, it only goes one way. And that was those kind of, those kind of details. Cause that's how fiction is. That's how fiction mm-hmm. works. You get the details, right. And most things follow, but so he, and then I decided, well, actually all this art history that's in it, this, this group that I made up, there's probably in total around 12 artists and they're all quite well thought out and, and mapped out and described. I said, you know, we should include that because at this point I decided to publish it myself with Broken Dimanche Press. We should include the art. And then I reached out to Darko to get his ideas and he said, sure, I can just do this. That's kind of, uh, he's a filmmaker as well. So I got extremely lucky to, co- to collaborate with him and he did his own kind of polyphonic, uh, compassionate, e- emphatic uh, e- kind of imagining of what these artworks. And so the novel comes with right. the artist's artworks. And so again, this idea of what's real and what's not, which was back then was actually kind of really being discussed in fiction. There was this kind of cri- moment of crisis because, um, and little did we know that that was about to cross over into like denial. That wasn't really fake news and uh, wasn't really a thing at the time, but we didn't know what was coming. And again, I think that's like fiction's art. You know, like that's the job we should be doing. We should be kind of uh guessing and and using what's about to come uh in its different guises as as a way of kind of getting people mentally maybe ready for it you know uh so yeah to this day people read the book and they think that all the artists are real right (laughs) and that the whole that they they, that they've read a non-fiction book somehow which is a great kind of um success maybe or failure but yeah right no, it's an interesting yeah. question. Who creates the fiction, right? Did you ever get any yeah. negative um, feedback or backlash for it or a critique? No, I would joke that not enough people have read it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, in a sense, it's uh, it kind of went out of print really quickly. And we I, print, right. I finally got a second edition out two years ago. And it's interesting to put it back, put it out again. Uh, 10 years later almost because it's doing all these things that are quite um, risk risky in a sense artistically and politically mm-hmm. but no I don't think so I mean that's the beautiful thing like Serbs or Serbia people would definitely tell me if they thought it was uh, upsetting and a lot of Serbians have read it and uh, so that's in a way like it's, at the end of the day it's their story the people of the the Balkans in a sense but it's also not really I mean history world history belongs to all of us it's it's again it's about doing it gener- doing it justice in that sense generosity of spirit the book doesn't tell us it's an apolitical book in a sense it's not it's all it's doing is really celebrating uh, the everyday <laughs> and maybe gay love I mean it happens that the, the story is right. uh, 
it's a it's a it's a gay love story. But in right. that sense, uh, yeah. Which again is something because I'm not I'm not necess- I'm not like I don't identify as hom- being homosexual. I'm not gay. Um, so in a way, it's also like added on top of that with the all the other things that was keeping it uh, maybe out of my uh, out of my um, which is just silly. I don't yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> so I you know because I I don't. Yeah. But then, you know, you have to be careful with some of this stuff. It's like the joke where it's like, oh, you know, I don't see, co- you know, I'm not racist. I don't right. see color. Like you end up kind of saying these platitudes and it's like, well, come on. Like, that's, you're just... Exactly. I cannot hear you anymore. You lost your mic. <laughs> no. Ah, no. I don't know what happened. You there. muted yourself, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got shut down. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that I was exactly the myself. right, the right reaction <laughs> from the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, no I, I was building up to it. Deserves it. No, but it's, it's it's funny. It's definitely it's really good to, to think about this stuff because it's not you can't pretend that it's easy and so often we're we're left with like a. A, a, a newspaper article or, or even worse just a tweet and right. it's just like this it's it's way too more complicated so it's great to be able to right show. which i guess is the point of your whole project in a way right it's to kind of create it is i guess to kind of map out like uh time and time and space to, to chat about yeah definitely definitely pain um pain schmerz yeah it's uh yeah, I don't know. The title was rather just a like a gut feeling, or just um, you know when you have like a stomach ache or something, or you just mm-hmm. feel unwell. Um, and like I said before, with the example of uh, me describing our time as fragmented, I'm I'm rather on the negative uh, side. I'm rather a pessimist, I would say, <laughs> than an optimist. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. thought, um, yeah, it was really great. Um, hearing also some more optimistic um, views or ideas from you on the same topic. Um, but totally, yeah, it's it's definitely a lot about um, narratives and who constructs narratives and why and how um, and who, um, who benefits from it and who does not um, definitely. And today in this conversation I I'm not sure if this makes any sense or probably this is also just a very subjective um, um, feeling or I don't know image that pops back um, into my head or uh, back uh, in front of my inner eye basically um, which I already thought about when I started reading Ulysses and I didn't come very far yet but um, it also kind of the whole story plays out at like a newspaper, right? Or it has something to do with this. Um, I'm reading it in German um, with like an advertisement that is supposed to be published yes. in a newspaper. Yeah. And at the same time, yes. you were talking about technology and also the book as technology and so on. And also a lot, it's a lot about um and you talked a lot about translation as well and the difficulties, but also the um, um, the benefits of translation, right? And um, and how we might also come together um, over language and over translations and uh, and through translations and so on. Um, so yeah, I don't know this whole idea of information and. Um, and ways of spreading information is really what I'm interested in. Um, and and I just always wonder if, you know, now that it's kind of a reoccurring theme in our conversation, if I don't think this is just accidental. Um, mm-hmm. I just think that, yeah, how we communicate is super Definitely. essential. Well, that's why you should you should uh, lo- you love Ulysses because it, there's so many communication <laughs> spread throughout it, and Joyce was very aware of that. Right. So he was really t- keen on this new this new thing of advertisement, right? 
and and so we didn't say that Leopold Room is a is an advertisement salesman. So his right. job is basically to place advertisements and uh, kind of to go between. So he's also a graphic designer, mm-hmm. which is, I also think is interesting for you. And suddenly he's got this visual edge, and but also like a and then in this Adam Curtis kind of link, right. you could kind of see that Joyce was predicting this this eighth century of the self, mm-hmm. where we would we would be again sold, communicated via advertising or totally. better selves, you know. Um, and so that's kind of happening now at like breakneck speed because the internet is again driven by advertising, which I think yeah. we all kind of collectively forget sometimes that we are. Um, and then, well, nowadays we know it that our basically our dad has even been right. uh, used. I was muted. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, I yeah, so I think I think you're. I think you're totally right. I just think, for example, there's another moment in Joyce's Ulysses where there's a postcard comes, and it's one of these like mysteries that I don't know. Probably somewhere on the internet or Joyce studies, uh, someone gets this postcard that with just the words up, up, like <laughs> U dot P in capitals, mm-hmm. and then U dot P, and it's kind of I don't know. To this day, I, I don't really understand what, but it's the fact that it's transmitted via this message, this postcard, and then that's upset the the. Uh, this man so much that the woman, his wife, goes around with it in in and in the story she appears in various moments with this technology to kind of show <laughs> how bad the sender is of it. So it's this weird, yeah, this weird kind of set of correspondences. And again, that's what I loved about like the ready mades. That's why I, it, it, the manuscript was this kind of MacGuffin where you would chase the story is often. Uh, well, I love stories that I use a MacGuffin, which is a communicating device to help the story further along but really uh is not that important it sets emotion everything else uh, hitchcock came up with the term mm-hmm. um and so that's kind of something similar to 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 how yeah communication as a as a as a narrative uh kickstarter can can really can really happen but yeah, yeah big question yeah, for sure um and let's see i also think like uh, we're on twitch like i, I think gaming uh, is like ripe has so much potential for just being some great stories mm-hmm. told in, in computer games and again it's something that's so young as an art form it's it's a bit misunderstood even though it's making more money mm-hmm. than cinema it's certainly making more money than than literature in its uh, establishment guises of the novel right. and so uh, yeah I mean I think that that's that's all like stuff that should be kept in mind um yeah you mentioned hannah aaron several times and i also mentioned her in in my questions um and uh-huh. the banality of evil right the banality of right the everyday everydayness of evil um yes yes it's a phrase that i think like obviously you know was misunderstood at in the time and it's sometimes wheeled out but yeah it's not that evil is banal no as, a, as opposed to like, like it's not entertaining enough or something mm-hmm. but but rather that uh yeah it's com- very commonplace yeah um yeah i mean that's the thing i mean i don't know we're constantly uh, uh i think it goes really deep again to like an ecological catastrophe in the sense that we uh the same way that like the, the inbuilt obsolescence is obscene of this infrastructure that we have, of these communicating devices, mm-hmm. as well as the coltan and whatever that goes into making them. But I think like it's just also, um, yeah, it's it's some, there's a massive wake up call that's coming. That I feel where we just kind of run out of the resources. Suddenly, this idea that it's acceptable to make something as sophisticated as an iPad, but yet we know that it's going to have to be replaced mm-hmm. in two years' time. It's just obscene. I also going to go a bit nuts about plastic bottles. <laughs> I didn't get to do that yet today. But again, I think like as communicating devices, they are incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, they, 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 they don't go, they literally take up space in the world and encapsulate air. And we allow these companies to to create them with absolutely no responsibility given to the, those creators of plastic bottles or to the to consumers and users of them, and they are literally clogging—they're uh, clogging the whole world. It's right. bizarre. 
and uh, they're not going anywhere. They literally are, you know, standing. One of our biggest legacies, biggest uh, archaeological record in the making. Um, it's really weird. Um, the yeah. plastic islands. <laughs> yes, it's it's uh, really yeah. upsetting. <laughs> so that's my that's my rant about that over. But yeah. But it is interesting when you think about communication in that sense, in, ecologi in a geo geological or archaeological sense, that this Anthropocene era that we're in. So. Cool. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, no, thank you, Andrea. This has been really great. I I've, I really enjoyed the chat. and um, I'm glad. Yeah, lots of things to think about.